Hello, boys and girls. This is Miss Whitney coming to you here from the First Baptist Church Sanctuary. And I'm so glad to speak with you this morning. Uh, some of you are getting ready to start your spring break this coming week and others in, in a few weeks ahead. And I just pray that you all get some rest and relaxation and have some fun. And um, boys and girls, I just want you to know I have something right here and I want you to see it. I think they're going to zoom in on it for me. And most of you will probably recognize this. This is my favorite emoji. I love to put this emoji on Facebook posts that I, that I send out, messages that I send out. Um, I do it just about all the time, actually, because to me it's, it's the smiley face emoji and it's just fun and it lets people know that I'm sending this message to them with a glad heart or maybe I'm just laughing or I find joy in something that they have said. And it reminds me too of a movie that I watched growing up. It was a Walt Disney movie. It's actually one of the classics now. And I think they actually just uh, released it from the vault a couple of years ago for a short period of time. But anyway, the m name of that movie was Pollyanna. And Pollyanna was an orphan that was, had moved and was going to live with her rich aunt that she had never met. And the short kind of summary of the movie was that she moves to this town and she meets a little boy, another orphan that she becomes friends with, and she meets and befriends all of the townspeople. And throughout the movie, uh, she and her friend, uh, the little boy, they go and do childish things, they play, they have a lot of fun. They go fishing at the creek and get really muddy and wet. They go to the, the house in the neighborhood that all the kids are afraid to go in and they just have a lot of fun and it has a lot of childish sweet qualities and but one of the main themes of this movie is gladness and Pollyanna being an orphan she has had some kind of rough situations that she's had to go through and she's developed this way to find gladness and happiness in everything that she does and it's called the glad game and whenever there's a situation that she is in that is negative, or if she really just doesn't care for it, she tries to come up with a way in that situation that she can find gladness. And in doing this, all the townspeople start to inquire. They wanna know, well, hey, what is this game? And she tries to tell them about it and get them to do it also, because there's a lot going on in the town, and some of the people are upset. They're angry about things, and she really just wants them all to be glad because she really cares about them. In Psalm 32, 11, it says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. I love this verse. It talks about joy in the Lord. Boys and girls, Jesus is our joy. And when you know Jesus in your heart as your Lord and Savior, that's where your joy, your true joy comes from. Joy is a gift from God. And he wants us to be happy and to be joyful in him always. So, boys and girls, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior or parents or whoever may be watching this video today, and if you want to have that true, true joy that only comes from Jesus, you can do that. All you have to do is ask Jesus into your heart. A, admit to God that you're a sinner because, hey, guess what? The Bible says that we all sin and we all do things that are wrong. We all fall short of the glory of God. B, believe that Jesus Christ is God's son and that he died on the cross for you to save you from your sins and C, confess him as your Lord and Savior. And if you do that and you truly mean it in your heart, that's it. That instance, he comes into your heart and he comes into your life and he saves you and you will receive that joy. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you and praise you for the joy only you can give us. We thank you for your word and the opportunities you give us to share it with others. 
Thank you for each child, each parent, and all the others who tune in to this message today. Lord, if there is anyone watching this that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to them in a way that only you can. Draw them closer to you, Lord, and bring them into a loving relationship with you. In your heavenly name I pray, amen.
Welcome. We're so glad you're joining us today uh, here for our for our online services at First Baptist Church of Pikeville. Um, maybe today is your first time checking us out online. Hey, we would encourage you to go to our website at fbcpikeville.org to get more information about our church and about the things that we have going on here uh, when we're not all uh, bogged down on quarantine. Um, also, for those of you that are interested in kind of what's going on in, uh, currently with the church right now, the website is the best place to find out that information along with this Facebook page that you're currently on. would like to remind you that Wednesday nights at 6.30 we'll be coming to you here on Facebook Live with a Wednesday night Bible study. We encourage all of you to attend. Many of you may not know that we are also doing videos for our students and those videos can be found in two places one again on our website under the student page or at our YouTube page itself which is SBC Pikeville students we'd encourage all students to go there check out the lessons that we've been doing and some of the funny videos that we've been doing as well one announcement that I'd like to make is we are still collecting food uh, for our backpack ministry and the two items that we still need are cereal and instant macaroni and cheese, the kind of macaroni and cheese that you can just add water and stick in the microwave. We still need those. Kids are getting ready to go on spring break uh, or at least with being on spring break, they won't have food services at the schools. So we'd really encourage you drop those by uh, anytime that you can. We appreciate all that you've done. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful that we can gather here to worship today. Lord, we're so thankful that you are our God. Lord, that you are mighty, you are powerful. And Lord, in the midst of all of this, we can still hear your voice. Lord, I ask right now that you bind the enemy and fill our, our living rooms and this worship space with your presence. Lord, that we can truly engage you at the throne of worship. Lord, we love you and we need you. It's in your son's name we pray. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us, uh, as Shane said, in your living rooms, at your kitchen table, uh, wherever you might be. I want to ask you to sing along with us, wherever you are. Perhaps you want to stand. Perhaps, uh, perhaps you want to stay seated. Uh, above all, we want to obey the scriptures and to worship the holy God, the one who is worthy of our worship. The psalmist says in Psalm 96, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his wondrous works among the peoples. For the Lord is great and is highly praised. This is our holy God. Let us worship him together. Sing with us, who can light the fires? Who can light the fires of a thousand burning suns? Blazing in the heavens, there is only one. He is our God. Who commands the nations, building up and tearing down? Silencing his rivals, there is only one. He is our God. You alone, Lord. He is our God. Holy, you alone are holy. Matchless in your glory. No one is like 
God. Who would come to save us when we turned away his love? Conquer us with kindness. There is only one. He is our God. Yes, you are. And he is our mystery that the holy king of creation would come for you and for me would offer himself up for our sins so that we might be like him i pray that as we sing the gospel together you will trust in christ come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the king he the theme of heaven's praises robed in frail humanity in our longing in our darkness now the light of life has come look to christ who condescended took on flesh to ransom us oh we look to christ come behold the wondrous mystery he the perfect son of man in his living and his suffering never trace Christ the Lord upon the tree, in the stead of ruined sinners, hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unveiled.
Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. Hallelujah, Lord. He came for us and took our sin. Hallelujah. church family I know it's still pretty weird being in these circumstances this is the week three of what we are just simply calling the church in exile we're not able to meet together in person uh, so we're having worship and I promise you we are worshiping this morning but we're doing it with social distancing measures in place and so I just want to tell you that we love you we miss you when this is over with uh, the spirit of worship that is going to be in our church auditorium is going to be incredible but that same spirit is there with you where you are this morning those are two powerful songs we just sang we have another one coming up but before we get to this next song and I bring a message to you today uh, just want to say a word of thanks many of you are continuing to give towards the missions and ministries that we are passionate about as a church family money that is going to make a difference for Jesus both here locally and globally around the world thank you for that if you would like to give if you haven't had a chance to yet or you're interested in giving for the very first time there's three ways that you can give first is by going to our website uh, FBC pikeville.org on the menu bar you're going to see a link that will let you that's titled give and you can give directly through that through an online account you can also send it to the physical address here at the church 126 4th street pikeville kentucky 41501 or simply drop it by the church whether or not anyone is in the office you can let one of us know by private message email or text and someone from the office can go to that door and pick up that for you if you would like to slide it under and so our church office hours until uh, further notice and we're told different will still be um, open we just won't be taking outside guests due to the uh, recommendations and request by our state government and federal government let me also say a word of thanks to so many of our Sunday school classes that have gathered and are going to be gathering later on um, even though we can't be in person with each other technology has given us just a great ability to still maintain fellowship so thank you to each and every teacher and every single person participating in classes if you are not in a Sunday school class currently and you would like to participate in this teaching, if you go to our church website, fbcpikeville.org, and under the link called Discipleship, you're going to see a video for each week's lesson taught by one of our teachers. I hope that's a help to you. You can use that. We can also get you digital copies of any curriculum that we use if you would like. And before I pray and we go into our next song, let me give you just a special word that we are very excited about. We're not sure what the next two weeks hold, but what we do know is next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Sunday the Sunday after that two weeks from today is Easter Sunday we have obviously here at the church been planning for months and months and months for these events and all of the plans that we had done to this point have now been tossed out the window that is just the nature of the world we are living in right now we are not repelling against that we're leaning into it and so we're not sure what the measures are going to be on us still two weeks from now but here's what our plan is if there are still allowances for us to still in social distancing measurements but we're not in a complete lockdown or or we don't have even more stronger um, distancing measures in place we are going to do what we're calling an Easter drive-in at Pikeville High School. We're going to gather at two times at Pikeville High School, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. We did this historically years and years ago, but we're going to do it like we have never done it before. We're going to do it like the old 50s drive-ins. Instead of you driving and getting out of your car to go into a building for worship, you're going to drive to Pikeville High School if you so choose and sit in your car and worship with us. It's going to be really like an old drive-in movie theater, except we're going to be worshiping together. What we hope to do, and we're going to be able to give you more details about this as the next week flows and goes along, we're going to gather at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. for two worship services. You'll be able to come, 
drive onto the property and sit there in your car and worship as Pastor Matthew, Pastor Shane, Mrs. Whitney, and myself are all there leading a worship service on the front steps of Pikeville High School. And instead of you getting out of your car or anything like that, we're going to let you stay right in your vehicle and tune to 93.1 WDHR and listen to the broadcast live on the radio with us. We can't be together physically any closer than that, but I guarantee after the weeks that we've had to this point, we're all going to love to get dressed up and just sit in our cars and see one another. I hope some of you ladies will wear hats that we can see through the windows on Easter if we get to do this. It's going to be a great time. We're trying to think outside the box. Now, we're still going to be broadcasting on Facebook Live that morning, so if you're uncomfortable getting out, you can still engage with us on this platform. We're also going to be broadcasting on Mountaintop TV as well, and so you'll be able to tune in on your television set to that live at 11 a.m. as well. We're really wanting to have a great Easter in spite of the circumstances we can't control, and I hope you'll join us in one way or another. Details are still to come, so be praying for us as we make them. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Well, Father, right now, this is a day that you have given us to worship. We might be in our pajamas. We might be gathered with our family around a television set. We might have a cup of coffee and our Bible open in front of us in a different context than ever before. But Lord, you're gathered with us. We are still your church. We don't, we're not going to church this morning, but we are still the church. And so this morning, bind our hearts as one, draw us near to you. I pray for anyone who's watching right now that feels far from you, feels that they are just disconnected, isolated, lonely. Father, they're experiencing a lot of guilt and grief in their heart. Pray this morning you'll speak to them in a powerful way through these songs and through this message you've given me today. Father, I ask you to continue with us and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we continue to worship through singing, I want to remind you of the words of the writer of Hebrews that writes to us, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is my prayer that God will grant us faith to trust Him through every difficulty, even in the midst of this season. And I pray that as we sing these next songs, that he will indeed strengthen your faith, that we might give him praise from an open and willing heart. You continue to sing with us. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, He watches o'er His own. He cannot fail, He must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. May we be known as a people of faith. By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's grand design In the lives of those who prove His faithfulness Who walk by faith and not by sight We trust you, Lord We worship our fathers roam the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by God's own hand a place where peace and justice
was triumphant from the grave. This is us, church. By faith, the church was called to go. With the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith this mountain shall be moved. pray with me. Father God, may you increase our faith so that we might be found faithful at the day of your return. For it is worthy, you are worthy of that walk. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, let me invite you to grab a copy of God's Word that you have handy and open with me to the Old Testament book of Joshua. The Old Testament book of Joshua. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 1, we're going to be in chapter 5, and we're going to be in chapter 6 this morning. And so uh, once you find chapter 1, if you'll just kind of stay there for a few minutes, and I'm going to tell you when we're going to move about in there. Also, uh, you should be able to find a copy of these notes online. We posted them on our Facebook page um, this weekend. You could, should also see those in the comments thread that um, our, uh, the one who's overseeing that for us, our administrator, is doing. And so if, you'll, if that's helpful to you, you can have a copy of today's sermon notes available to you there online in front of you on your smartphone, your iPad, whatever you use, and then your Bible open to Joshua chapter 1. We are, are really, all of us, still experiencing so many changes to what we consider normal. Normal in our lifestyles, normal in our daily routines. Uh, the past two or three weeks are going to be unforgettable in the candles of history, but especially those of us who have lived through it and are, are going to be telling these stories for years to come. There are a lot of things that we miss right now. Uh, there are things that we miss in relationship. There are things we miss in our occupations. And there are other things that we miss that might be considered trivial but at the same time are important to us. And I'm not going to lie to you, I'm really missing college basketball right now. I'm really missing March Madness. I'm saddened that we are not in it. Uh, this would be the time when the greatest games all year long are being played, and we're not getting to see them right now. I, I know I, I'm sad for those players. I'm sad for our high school players that their season ended uh, abruptly. I'm saddened for the college players who worked so hard and, and didn't even get to go into their postseason play. I'm sad we don't get to watch it. 
I miss that. And I'm trying to sustain my sadness, and I'm, I'm watching replay of old games, but I also did something um, that is a, a pretty good tradition for me. I got out my old copy of the movie Hoosiers. Hoosiers was a movie from 1985 uh, starring Gene Hackman. It's one of my favorite. It's sitting on my dresser at home right now so I can get my fix of March Madness. It's the story of this washed out former coach who in high school, a high school basketball coach, overcomes these incredible challenges to take a small town basketball team all the way to the Indiana High School State Championship game. So this is a team that really no one expected much out of. They had never had really much of a winning streak or season whatsoever, and no one was expecting much out of them. They had played every one of their games in these really old, worn-down, small-town gymnasiums, and now that they have had this just miracle dream season and have made it to the championship game, they're going to play the biggest game of their career in, a, in an arena that's ten times the size of their high school gymnasium. They're going to play in the massive home court arena of the Indiana University Hoosiers. They've never been in an arena like this before, let alone played the biggest game of their high school careers in this place. So in one of the most iconic scenes of the movie, a scene everybody still remembers, Gene Hackman's character, Coach Dale, walks his team into IU's arena the day before the game. He knows they're very nervous. He knows uh, that they're intimidated walking into this. And so they go in, and he hands two of his players a tape measure and tells them to measure the height of the rim to the floor. And they get back, and they tell the coach it's 10 feet. He says, okay, I want you to measure the distance from the free throw line to the center of the rim and center of the basket, and they say, it's 15 feet. Everything was standard. Everything was regulation. Everything was like they had played on all year round. What was going on around them, their circumstances were different, but the fundamentals were the same. That was his point. His point was they might be playing in a bigger venue than they'd ever been in before, but nothing about the game was any different. The basics that they had worked so long on were still the same. The key to their victory was to remember that even when the arena is different and even bigger than they've ever been used to before the basics to winning are still the same friends as we look at the landscape of our world right now as we think about what's going on in our lives in our culture our nation and in the world at large it feels like we are in an arena that is bigger than we've ever dealt with before we can feel very overwhelmed by the weight of the pressure that's on us right now it feels like we're outmanned. It feels like we're outnumbered. You may feel like the, the odds are stacked against you and, and it feels like you're going to suffocate and things are just too big and too much for you to handle. That might be true in your business right now, in your workplace, or it could be the fact that your job is in limbo or maybe you've already lost it and that has made it feel like a bigger arena than you've ever had to deal with before might be true in your finances. It might be true in a family situation. It might be true in the life of one of your children or your grandchildren who are experiencing some of the hardest days because of the circumstances around us right now. You know, it, it might be true of a relationship problem or the stress of your marriage and the days that we just can't control things going on around us. It might be true of the mental or emotional stress you're feeling being, being socially distanced from individuals you're so used to being around. The lack of routine and the not being able to do the things that you're used to doing is just really getting you down. We're facing a lot of pressure. We're facing a lot of challenges right now. The arena of life that we're in right now probably feels bigger than any of us have ever played in before. We might feel like we're not up to this task. We may wonder if we have enough to get through this and to actually play. But friends, I hope you hear me when I say the Bible tells us the arenas of our life are always changing and are always presenting challenges, but the basics to victory are still exactly the same as they've always been. And we find those in God's word. This morning, 
we're going to discover about the story of about how in the story of a man named Joshua how God speaks into our present circumstances see Joshua was the man who followed Moses in the leadership uh, movement in Old Testament history see Joshua has was actually the one who led the Israelites into the promised land after Moses died that's what chapter one is about and this is a story about how victory doesn't come by how smart we are by how strong we are, by how strategic we are, or how skilled or capable we are. This is a story about how victory comes by faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one big idea I want you to take away from this message. Typically, I would say I want you to walk out the doors with it this morning. I just want you to take it wherever you are and make it your own and know it to be true in your life today, and it's this truth. Spiritual victory isn't achieved through a fight. It's received through faith. That's the key we learn to spiritual victory in the life of Joshua. See, when God takes us into an arena that is overwhelming, a circumstance that is overpowering, he doesn't call us up to battle, but he carries us through by faith. Faith is what taps our weakness into God's strength. Faith is what links our nothingness to God's almightiness. Faith is what makes the difference in everything we face in the days we're in now and in every day we have until we see Jesus face to face. The arena that you're in may change. It may be bigger than you've ever faced before. But faith will show you the measurements are the same no matter what is happening around you. I want to invite you to write down with me or take notes on your uh, smartphone with me right now. Three principles, three things that faith will give us in every arena of life that we're going to see in Joshua's story this morning. Number one, I want you to write down, faith supplies me with God's courage. Faith supplies me and you with God's courage. Now, if you're in Joshua chapter 1, I just want you to notice how the book begins in verse 1 of that first chapter. The Bible says this, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving them to the people of Israel. Now stop right there just a second. We're going to keep reading in a moment. But I just want you to notice, Joshua, this isn't the first time he's been mentioned in the Bible. Joshua was mentioned the very first time all the way back in Exodus, and he's described there as one of the commanders of Israel's army. But when you get to the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 11, verse 28, Joshua is described as Moses' personal assistant, just as he's described here. Uh, he was, ever since a very young man, the right-hand man of Moses. And so he was like the body man for Moses. Presidents always have a body man, the personal assistant who's with them. That was uh, Joshua. So if you're a fan of the West Wing, the old television show of the West Wing like I am, uh, Joshua was the Charlie to Moses' President Bartlett. If you don't understand that reference, don't worry about it. Just know uh, Joshua was the second in command. He was incredibly important. He was also one of the 12 spies that Moses sent to, to investigate the promised land decades and decades before this to see if it was time for them to enter. And so two of those spies out of the 12 come back, Joshua and Caleb, and they say, yeah, the promised land has its challenges. It's not going to be easy, but we're up to this challenge. God will give us the victory. But, other, but the 10 other spies that came back, 10 against 2, voted and contradicted these two young men and they said there's no way we can do this it's too hard it's too challenging there's too much there we can't do this we need to go a different direction we're not up to this see Joshua and Caleb were right they were operating by faith and God rewarded them because when it was time to enter the promised land both Joshua and Caleb were able to enter and taste the victory in the promised land but the other ten spies all died before they were able to cross the shores of the Jordan. So that's kind of the historical background going on here. Look beginning in verse 3 with me, okay? Chapter 1, verse 3. 
The Bible says every place, God is speaking here, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Did you notice where the source of Joshua's confidence is to be found according to God? It's not to be in himself. It's not to be in his abilities or his leadership skills. I know that a lot of us, we have been told, some of us since we were very young, we've been told to look inside ourselves to find our confidence, to find that courage that's buried deep within us and that is just ours inalienably. Maybe it was someone who had really good intentions. It might have been your parent. It might have been a coach. It might have been a teacher or a counselor. Maybe it was a talk show host you listened to at some time. They said, look within yourself to find that courage, that confidence you need. I'm certainly not criticizing the person that told you that. I'm sure they had very good intentions. I'm just saying, most of the time, we're told to look in the wrong places for our true confidence. But we're, we're not going to find real confidence. We're not going to find real courage looking in ourselves. See, our courage for spiritual battles and challenges comes from outside of us. It comes from God. See, our courage doesn't come from looking at what's inside of us. Our courage comes from looking at who's beside us, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go on with me, notice what verses 6 and uh, and 7 say, and then down to verse 9. Be strong and courageous, God says, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous being careful to do according to all the law my Moses servant commanded you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. This is verse 9. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Do you know what courage means in the Christian life? It's really simple. It's really simple. Courage simply means you're already walking on conquered ground. And the ground you're walking by faith with courage that comes from God was conquered by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. You see, Jesus is the one who has already won the victory that can give you courage. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan's kingdom came crashing to the ground. Friend, I hope you understand this spiritual truth. Satan is sailing a sinking ship right now. Satan has no victory, and he doesn't want you to know that. He doesn't want any of us to live with the reality and live in the, in, in the knowledge of the fact that he has been stripped of any power he might have and any victory he might have through the cross of Jesus Christ. In, in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, the Apostle Paul says that God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I, I hope you hear what that verse said. It says, he has blessed us. It doesn't say he will bless us. It doesn't say he might bless us. It says he already has blessed us. So what that means is you already have all the blessings of heaven available to you right now. All the patience that you need, all the love that you need, all the faith that you need, all the wisdom you need, all the courage you need for whatever lies in front of you is already supplied to you through the mercies of of the majestic God of heaven who loves you. Friend, this morning, we need to plant our flag of faith in the ground of God's promises and say, these are mine. This courage belongs to me because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Friend, faith supplies you the courage you need in days like this. Number two, I want you to write down that faith also shows me God's holiness. Faith will show you and I God's holiness. Now, I want you to flip in your Bible over to Joshua chapter 5. I want you to go to the end of the chapter. I want you to look at verses 13 and 15 with me. Joshua's first big challenge as he is going in to and leading the army of Israel is to take the city of Jericho. And you need to understand, the city of Jericho was not an entry-level 
battle. This wasn't the easy first job. This would have been the hardest of hard challenges. In fact, by many human standards, Jericho would seem almost impossible to conquer. It was one of the most fortified cities of the ancient world. Its walls were thick enough that two chariots could ride side by side across the top of those walls. So here we find Joshua, when we come to the end of chapter 5, he's preparing for the biggest battle he's ever faced as a leader. And this is the night before they're going to go into Jericho and go to battle, and he's leading this army. He must not have been able to sleep because it's very late at night when we pick up in verse 13, and he's walking around, and he has made his way actually to the city of Jericho, and he's able to walk around unnoticed on the exterior of that massive city. He's probably reminiscing about the time he had already been to Jericho decades and decades before as a spy, but as he knows that this is going to be his true test of leadership, He's probably praying and asking God for help as well. And I want you to look at what happens when he is outside that city the night before the biggest battle of his life. In verse 13 of chapter 5, we read this. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And the man said, No. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So here's what's going on in this story. Joshua is walking around at night, praying, doing whatever he's doing to pep himself up for this battle, and he just runs into this man who he's never seen before. This guy's in full military armor, and he's got a sword drawn in his hand. This is a guy ready to do battle. And so what does Joshua do? What would you do if you ran into someone like this in the middle of the night? Well, Joshua doesn't run away, he doesn't cower, he doesn't beg for mercy. Joshua puts his hand on his sword and goes right up to this guy and challenges him to a fight. That's what it means when it says Joshua went up. It's telling us Joshua is looking this guy eyeball to eyeball and he says, look fellow, we are about to go to battle and I'm going to give you two options. You can fight me right here and right now and right here or you can join us but somebody's getting bloody, and it's not going to be me. I mean, this is the attitude Joshua has. I mean, isn't this great? Joshua has no fear. I'm convinced the only person that should ever be allowed to play Joshua in any motion picture should only ever be Chuck Norris because he is the only person I can fathom being brave enough and tough enough to pull something like this off. I mean, we could rightly say that Superman doesn't wear Chuck Norris pajamas. He wears Joshua pajamas because this is a man who is just completely marked by bravery. And when Joshua gives him these two options, notice the the response he gets from this man in military armor. The man says, no. What's funny here is Joshua said, I've given you two options, and no's not really the answer to either of them. This wasn't a yes or no question. Joshua says, you've got two options, and this man looks back and says, I don't like either of them. No, that's not the way I'm going. He looks at Joshua, and he says, Joshua, you're asking me the wrong question. He says, I'm the commander of the Lord's army, and now I'm right here. I have come. What he's saying is this, and it's important for us to understand this in the biblical context. What this angel is saying, he says, Joshua, I haven't come to take sides. I've come to take over. Friends, if you want to experience the spiritual victory that God gives in your life, stop trying to get God on your side and start getting on his side. That's the key we see here in this. God isn't interested in taking sides in any battle you're trying to fight. God is only coming to battle when when he can take over. God comes when he's going to take over. You're never going to know the victory that faith brings until you do exactly what Joshua did here, here and fall down on your face in worship when you come with him and he says, I'm here to take over. 
See, Joshua knows who he's standing in front of, and he just falls down in reverence. This man who we recognize to be an angelic representative, one who is representing the very presence of God in front of him, says, this man says, take off your sandals because this is holy ground you stand upon. Remember, this is something that is not unprecedented. This has happened before in the life of Moses at the burning bush. Uh, Joshua's mentor before, and this happened in Moses' life before his biggest battle too. See, God shows up and displays his holiness at the times when we need it most. God displayed his holiness to Moses, and now he's displaying his, no, his holiness the night before Joshua's biggest battle. Do you know what it means when God shows up here in holiness before Joshua the night before his battle? It means Joshua doesn't have to carry his burden alone because he has had a fresh encounter with the blazing holiness of God who is a warrior that will fight for him. Joshua's battle is over for all intents and purposes. God has already won the victory. This is what God offers even now to you and to me. The question is never whether or not God is on our side or not on our side. The question is whether we are on God's side, whether we are submitted face down to his sovereign rule and authority over our lives. He is the almighty over heaven and earth and all power and glory belongs to him friend in your battle you don't want God on your side you want to be on his side as he takes over he can show you his holiness in whatever arena you're in and number three I want you to write down this last principle faith will also secure for me God's victory Faith will also secure for me God's victory. Now, when we move on, that's the end of chapter 5. When we move on to chapter 6, God gives Joshua some very unusual instructions, and that's probably the nicest way I can say it. I mean, that's the least we could say about it because this is really odd. But Joshua is ready to follow anything God tells him to do. And when you hear what God tells him, it doesn't sound like a plan at all. It sounds like the ramblings only a crazy person would come up with. God doesn't tell Joshua to build battering rams to go to war. He doesn't tell him to dig trenches to get ready for the battle. He doesn't tell him to get ladders so they can scale this mammoth wall. So what does God tell Joshua to do to prepare for this battle? Look in chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands with its kings and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. You shall do it for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark, on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. It, this is just really comical when you read what's going on. God looks at Joshua. God tells Joshua, he says, look, Joshua, I want you to march around the walls of Jericho, almost like a kindergarten class marching out for recess. And he says, then on the seventh day, I want you to march around it seven times on that seventh day. Listen, if you're an army that wants to look tough and intimidating as you're going to battle, You've got to have great faith in God to be able to do this as your strategy. See, everybody knows in this army that this is a plan that will never work. But the only problem is it did work exactly the way God said it would. They followed the word of the Lord exactly. And on the seventh day, after the seventh trip around this city, when they blow the trumpets, when they yell with a mighty yell, this impenetrable wall known as the city, around the city of Jericho comes crashing to the ground and Israel gains this miraculous victory, their first time out to battle. And they beat one of the strongest cities in the ancient world. Why does God choose to give his people victory in this way? It's to show a principle, and I want you to hear me very clear on this. There's an important principle God is showing through this victory, and it's that what God wants to do through us is not nearly as important as what God wants to do in us. 
What God's interested in doing through you is not nearly as important as what God wants to do in you. Friend, God was preparing the Israelites' faith for the promises that he had made. God never wants his people focused on the outcome. God wants us focused on obedience. See, the outcome of a battle all belong to God. That's his responsibility. But the obedience along the journey is your responsibility and my responsibility. See, every time the Israelites, every single day that the Israelites would walk around that city, those walls would get bigger and bigger. They'd seem even harder and harder to overcome. It would get more and more impossible for them to win in their minds until God showed up and did what they could never do on their own by themselves. See, did you know that sometimes God will keep a problem in front of you? He'll keep you right there so you're walking around it and you have to see it time and time again until you get to the point that you are completely convinced there is no way you can solve it on your own. And when you get to that place, that's when God says, you can't, but I can a man named Ian Thomas once said a great statement. I'm going to show you on the screen right now. I think it's fantastic. I think you should write it down. Ian Thomas once said, we ought to say, God, I can't. You never said I could. You can. You always said you would. Isn't that great? When we get to the point that we're walking around, whatever our Jericho is, we're looking up and we're saying, God, I can't. This is outside of me, but you can that's when God takes over and shows his power and gives victory. See, this is, this is where I think the problem lies for so many of us. And this is what I worry about for, for a lot of us. See, you can be in a point where you've gone around your Jericho six times and you're ready to quit. You're, you're not convinced. Your faith is weak. I've already done this six times. Why do I have to do it a seventh? I don't see victory in this. I don't feel there's hope. This is too big. I don't believe God will actually take this down for me. What's the point of doing it a seventh time? My friend, wait upon the Lord. Rest in him. Trust him. He has secured your victory through the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will bring that house down in his time. We never fight for victory in our Christian lives. We're always fighting from victory. Look at how this chapter ends. I want you to just notice the end of chapter 6, because this is the whole point that we need to see about Joshua. It says, so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Friends, God had a better plan for Joshua than he could have ever done on his own. But it all started with surrender. Joshua had to place his faith in God to supply him with courage. He had to place his faith in God to show his holiness. He had to place his faith in God to secure that victory God gives. God had a better plan, and he has a better plan for you too. But it starts with surrender. Just like, Jer just like at Jericho, there's coming a day when another trumpet is going to sound. There's coming a day when shouts are going to be declared that will be heard on every square inch of the earth. There's coming a day when a man with a drawn sword is going to be coming back in glory. His name is Jesus. And he's going to come to planet earth in victory for a final battle that removes all evil and brings heaven with him. And my question to you is, as you watch this, wherever you are this morning, are you ready? Have you bowed before Jesus? Have you taken your shoes off before his holiness? Have, are you ready to surrender fully to him? If you have, or if you are willing to do so today, I can promise you that victory is yours only through faith in him. It's because of what he did, not what you do. He promises it for all who are his children by faith in his name. Friend, are you today needing to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior? See, he died on the cross to pay for your sins. And today, right where you are, right where you sit, right whatever circumstance you're in, right whatever arena you're facing, if you will repent of your sin and receive him into your heart, you will be saved. It is the free gift of God that comes by simple faith. He'll make you a new creation. 
He'll give you new life. He'll, and heaven is waiting for you because of Christ. After I pray, Pastor Matthew is going to close us with a song that I think is very, very appropriate. It's going to be a song that speaks to you. But I want to tell you, if you would like to respond to this personally today, if the Lord's been speaking to you and you say, Lord, I'm not in a church, there's no aisle to walk, there's no altar to come to, but I, I really feel like you're speaking to me and I feel like I need to respond, would you do me a favor? Would you go to that little private message box up in the corner and would you send a private message to my Facebook account or to this church Facebook account and tell us how we can be praying for you and what God is telling you you need to do right now? Or would you send me an email at my email address? It's pastor.john.lucas at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I'd love to walk with you through whatever response, whatever decision you need to make today. I know we can't do it in person, and it's very hard. It's very challenging for us. But if you're willing to take that step of courage, that step of obedience, I'm going to come alongside of you and help you with whatever decision you have to make. As we sing this song, I want to invite you to join in wherever you are. Maybe you want to stand with your family, or maybe you just want to sit there and privately worship with your arms in the air. However you choose to, this is a song about the victory God has given you in Christ. Bow your heads with me. Father, thank you for showing us these great truths. Thank you for the victory that has been won for us through Christ. Thank you that by faith, all the blessings and promises are ours in Him. I thank you and I pray today that many have their faith placed in you. Father, I pray for those that are just needing once again to reaffirm their faith. Father, we need to do that regularly and just say, this is where my victory is found. This is where my, the supply of my courage comes from. This is where my seeing you and your glory comes from. God, this is where my victory comes from. It's from my faith in Christ and his complete and utter victory for me. For some of you, this might be something you need to do for the very first time. Father, I pray today that we will come face to face with Jesus and we'll find him faithful. May we know that we're safe. May we know we're welcome. Help us to apply this and walk in these truths. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. And is the glory of the Lord to be a light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? A lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? And together we sing. He is. It does a fall truly love us he does and as the spirit move among us he does and does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves he does does our God intend to dwell again with us See you. 
Is he worthy of this? He is. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? He Thank you for joining us today on this worship service. We're looking forward to the chance to meet with you again in person, but until that day comes, please join us again on Wednesday night. We have our prayer meeting at 6.30 in this space. gives you a chance to interact with us, let us pray with you, and then we'll continue in Sunday morning services until we're able to gather back in our normal schedule. Until those days, please know you are loved. Show love to one another as we long for the day when Christ comes again and sets right every wrong. He is worthy. God, give your blessings to your people in Jesus' name.